Detroit. Eric ran like his life depended on it, but his weak body was no match against these thugs. Scott quickly caught up to Eric and tripped him. He fell face forward into a heaping pile of dirt garbage. As he rolled onto his back, Eric met with a powerful punch to the face. He struggled to push Scott off as he rained blows down upon him. Eric dodged the right hook, but then Scott punched him in the kidney. He winced with pain. Scott was much bigger and stronger than he was. A force to be reckoned with. How dare you try to escape? You owe us a lot of money, punk! Scott punched him in the gut. If Eric didn't escape now, not only would he be a gunner, his wife and sister would be next. Thinking only of them, Eric kicked Scott's knee. He stumbled backward, and Eric took his chance to get back up as his attacker stumbled to his feet. He ran like the wind. You won't get away with this, Scott called after him. Time to die, loser, he laughed sinisterly as he gave chase. Eric didn't look back. He kept running. He turned right and then left, trying to lose them through the twisted alleyways. He needed to hide, so when Eric saw the ladder of a fire escape on one of the brick buildings nearby, he grabbed the lowest rung. He used every ounce of strength in his weak upper arms to pull himself up. He booked it up several flights of stairs and hoisted himself up onto the roof of the 12-story building. Eric didn't know it, but an old man watched his escape from the shadows. The old man didn't intervene. He only watched and waited. Eric caught his breath and looked over the side of the building. He saw Scott and his buddies running nearby. Where did he go? Scott asked out of breath. His cronies shook their head. I don't know, boss. First one to find him gets 50 bucks. Go on, find the bastard now. Eric backed away from the ledge and listened as the man's footsteps ran away in three different directions. They didn't see where he went, so he successfully bought himself a little time. He breathed a sigh of relief. Think, Eric, think. He whispered to himself. He hit his head as if that would shake a few ideas loose. He owed Scott a lot of money, and there was no way he could pay it all back. If they didn't find him soon, they would go after his wife and sister. Even if they did find him, his wife and sister were in danger. Scott would stop at nothing to destroy his family. There was only one way out of this mess. Tears streamed down Eric's cheeks at the thought. The only way he could save his family was to take his own life. Maybe then... Scott will leave his wife and sister alone. He was better off dead. Eric looked back over the side of the building. It was a long way down. It was high enough that the fall would kill him. If he was smarter, maybe he could think of a better solution. Alas, Eric was a simple man of limited intellect. This was the end of the line for him. He took a deep breath and dangled his feet over the side of the building. He sat on the ledge and prayed. Please, God, watch over Stephanie and Carla. Protect them from my enemies. Give them everything in life that I couldn't. Tears turned into sobs as he thought of his loved one, his sick sister and his drop-dead gorgeous wife. He shook the image of them away because it was too painful. It was easier not to think at all now. Without another thought, he closed his eyes and pushed himself off the ledge. His body fell 12 stories down and crashed onto the pavement below. He died on impact. The old man watching from the shadows limped over to Eric's dead body. This was the exact opportunity he had been waiting for. He closed his eyes, outstretched his arms and chanted, Otsum Paragon, Aum Provat Nami San. He leaned over and fell onto the dead body. A mysterious smoke surrounded them in a flash. The soul switch took place. Eric Turner stood up and saw the old man's dead body lying on the pavement. The possession was successful. The 5,000 year old soul that lived in the old man now possessed Eric Turner's bruised body. He was dazed and needed a place to rest to make the transformation complete. He looked back and saw the building behind them was a worn-out old hotel. He couldn't have planned this better. He leaned down and took the money from the pockets of his former self. 
he gathered all his strength and limped into the hotel. Yeah, how could I help you? The man behind the counter asked. I need a room for the night. Eric coughed out. Eighty bucks. Eric threw some crumpled bills onto the counter and grabbed a key from the man. Room three, down the hall. Eric nodded. The new soul that possessed his body said, If anyone comes looking for me, I'm not here. The man behind the counter looked Eric up and down. His forehead bled, his lip was cracked, and his clothes were dirty. He nodded, and Eric limped down the hall to his rented room. He opened the door to room three. It was nothing but an old cot and a side table in the threadbare room. A neon sign flickered in the window. It would have to do. Eric passed out on the cot and let his ancient soul rest as the new possession took hold. Swapping bodies was exhausting, and he passed out before his head hit the pillow. A series of powerful knocks awoke him. He looked around the small, darkened room he rented last night. Memories of Eric Turner's life flooded in. They came so fast it gave him a headache. The possession was complete. This was the hundredth body this soul possessed, but the process was always painful. He knew Eric needed serious help, or else he wouldn't have jumped off a building, but he had no idea the trouble that awaited him on the other end of the door. The 5,000-year-old soul had possessed merchants, soldiers, and even emperors, but Eric Turner's life was truly a disaster. Whoever was outside the door was angry. Eric sighed and limped over to the door. This body was weak, and he hadn't rested enough to fully recover his strength. He felt like a newborn learning to walk again. Eric opened the door and saw three men staring him down. The one with dyed red hair snarled. He looked like the leader of the pack. What can I do for you? Eric asked. The red-haired man pushed the door open and the man walked inside the tiny room. Do you really think we wouldn't find you? I own this town. Eric wasn't strong enough to fight back, so he sat on the bed to gather his strength. He closed his eyes and raced through the body's memories to realize the thug before him was named Scott King. You have two choices, God said. You can pay me back, or I'll take your wife as my slave for a month. Wife? Eric thought. He searched his memory bank to realize that not only did he have a wife, he had a gorgeous wife who everyone lusted after. Even Scott King wanted a turn with her. How much do I owe you? Eric asked. Scott laughed. A million dollars. But since you've made things so difficult for me, make it 1.5 for my trouble. Let's call it interest. Eric nodded, thinking. We all know you have no way of paying it back. So go get your wife and bring her to me. Let me have my way with her for a month. And then your debt will be cancelled. I'll even give you another loan so you can keep your stupid sister on life support. Boom, memories flooded Eric, and he remembered this poor body's predicament in full. He was overcome with emotions from the previous soul and its quest to protect his family. The new Eric knew that he would have to take up the task of protecting his little sister and wife from these hoodlums. When powerful emotions such as these populate the mind, one can never forget them. He thought of it as a duty to fix the most important problems of any body he possessed. How is my sister doing? He asked. Scott laughed. Not well. She's not as pretty as your wife, but I can show her one last good time before she dies if you want. Scott and his cronies laughed. Their vile nature disgusted this new Eric Turner. Rage filled his soul. He remembered being someone that people pushed around. But all that changed the moment the possession took hold. Eric stood up and grabbed Scott by the throat. His swift and sudden movements shocked everyone. His soul's strength was slowly returning to this weak new body. Leave my sister alone. Let go of me! Scott gurgled. Eric's grip blocked his airway. Scott's two thugs didn't know what to do. Eric Turner had always been a coward. They never expected to see such strength from him. He tightened his grip on Scott's throat. Help! Scott called out. His two friends grabbed switchblades and prepared to attack. 
Eric dropped Scott on the floor and moved toward them. He swiftly snatched both of their knives away before they could blink. He wielded both knives in a strong battle stance. How do you do that? Scott asked, still lying on the floor, gripping his neck and catching his breath. Eric moved toward him and slammed his foot in Scott's crutch. He yelled with pain as his face turned as bright as his dyed hair. Eric kept his foot there, poised to inflict more pain in the sensitive area. I'll kill you all if you mess with me, my sister or my wife. If I owe you money, I will pay back my debt. You have my word. But under no circumstances will you hurt anyone in my family. Got it? Fear filled Scott in his friend's eyes. Who or what had taken over Eric Turner? Eric raced out of the hotel with determination. He'd inherited this mess and intended to fix everything. But it wasn't going to be easy. He was still getting used to this body and his immortal strength hadn't fully returned. At least the limp left over from his previous body had healed. Luckily, he felt strong enough to keep those thugs in check. At least, for now. Eric downloaded more memories as he made his way to the hospital to check on his sister, Stephanie. She suffered from a rare disease, and the impoverished Detroit hospitals were ill-equipped to handle it. The previous soul that inhabited this body was poor, so he took to gambling to pay her medical bills, which only caused more trouble. His wife's family business was successful, and he got some money from them. But sensing his uselessness, they quickly cut him off. He raced to Stephanie's hospital bed and was relieved to see her alive and breathing. But she was barely hanging on by a thread. A flash of gratitude flashed over him that he took over this poor body because this 5,000-year-old soul knew ancient healing techniques that could save this young girl. If he hadn't possessed this body, she would surely die. It's okay, Stephanie. I'm here now. He grabbed her cold hand and stroked her hair. She didn't open her eyes, but she seemed stable. Eric, is that you? Where have you been? A woman called to him. He turned around and saw a gorgeous woman standing in the doorway with her hands on her slender hips. She was tall and voluptuous with an oval face, rosy white skin and delicate features like a fairy. This old soul had seen countless women over the 5,000 years he walked earth, and he was shocked that she was the most beautiful he'd ever seen. He searched his memory bank to place her. Carly, there's my beautiful and amazing wife. Eric walked over and wrapped her with a warm embrace. Her jaw dropped at his strange affection, and she pushed him away. Excuse me? You've been missing for weeks and you expect me to be happy to see you? Where have you been? Drinking at the casino with your loser friends again? You're right. I'm sorry I've been MIA. That's not fair to you. She softened slightly, surprised by his apology. He usually made excuses for his poor behavior. Do you remember how we met? He asked as he grabbed her hand tenderly. Carly pulled away. Of course I remember. Why are you bringing that up now? He smiled, accepting the memory fully. You were ill, just like my sister. You recovered soon after we met. Carly softened completely. I remember. I felt like you helped me get better somehow. They both smiled as they looked into each other's eyes. If Eric was married to such a beauty, surely living in this body wouldn't be so bad. A handsome doctor and two nurses followed, entering the small hospital room. <clears throat> Excuse me, am I interrupting? The doctor said with a clear of his throat. Eric searched his memory for thoughts on the doctor, but he had never seen him before. He must be new around here. Hello, who are you? Eric asked. I'm Dr. George Bates, and you are? Eric Turner, Carly's husband and Stephanie's brother. A husband? Carla, I didn't realize you were married, the doctor said as he flushed a deep purple. The nurses shared a look. Eric immediately understood the situation. This doctor was trying to woo his wife in his absence. Too bad he didn't stand a chance now that the new and improved Eric was in town. 
Eric's been gone a lot recently, Carlyle said, embarrassed. Ah, I see. Well, nice to meet you, Eric. The doctor extended his hand to shake, but Eric ignored it. Carlyle noticed and crossed her arms at his rudeness. Carlyle and I went to college together. She told me about your sister, and I've come to help, Dr. George Bates explained. Tell me, doctor, can you cure my sister? I'm afraid it's not looking too good. George started to say, but Eric interrupted him. He turned to Carly and said proudly, The reason I've been missing is because I went away to train with an ancient healing master. Ancient healing master? Carly said with surprise. She rolled her eyes. You've got to be kidding me. The nurses shared more glances. George laughed. <laughs> with all due respect, Eric, your sister needs real medicine. That's why Carly called me. Leave it to the professionals. So you, being an expert, can cure her then, Eric pushed. That's not exactly what I said. George blushed, surprised at Eric's aggressiveness. After all, his clothes were dirty, his forehead was bruised, and he was nothing special to look at. How did he even score a wife as amazing as Carly? George vowed to steal her away from this arrogant man. Then it's up to me to cure her. Eric knew if he let things continue to unfold, Stephanie would die. He couldn't tell them who he really was, but he knew his ancient healing techniques were far better than anything Dr. George Bates could do for her. What are you talking about, Eric? You sound ridiculous. Clearly, you hit your head recently. I can cure my sister, he said boldly. I found a cure. And what might that be? George asked with his arms crossed. The nurses and Carly crossed their arms too. The ancient healing techniques, similar to... He searched his memory bank for the modern word to his ancient healing technique. It's similar to acupuncture. Everyone burst out laughing, except Carly, who shook her head and sighed with embarrassment. <laughs> they don't teach that at the Royal College of Medicine, George said in between belly laughs. Is that where you studied? Eric asked. Yes, it is. George said proudly. Eric shrugged. Never heard of it. George rolled his eyes. Carla pulled Eric aside and said, That's enough. You're embarrassing me. It's one thing to lie about why you've gone missing, but it's another thing to play games with Stephanie's life like this. Especially after all we've sacrificed to keep her alive this long. I promise I can cure her. She won't make it much longer unless we let George treat her. Even then... We might lose her soon. You need to prepare for the worst now. Eric grabbed Carly's hands, but she pulled them away again. My dear wife, you don't believe me, do you? Carly sighed. You haven't given me a reason to believe in you in a long time. Now, please stop embarrassing me. I've called Dr. Bates here to help. He's doing us a big favor, so step aside and let him do his job. Eric looked at Stephanie asleep in her hospital bed. It was true. She was near death. Something drastic had to be done soon to save her. This was a matter of life and death. I'm sorry, Carly. I can't do that. I won't let Dr. Bates operate on my sister. Why won't you let Dr. Bates get on with his treatment? You can't be serious. You're going to say Stephanie to her grave for sure! Carly screamed with a horrified look on her face. I need you to trust me, dear. Eric pleaded. I know what I'm doing. I promise. Since when? Carly demanded. Huh? Since when do you know what you're doing about anything? Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt your lively conversation, said Dr. Church Bates. But we really need to discuss Stephanie's treatment plan before she takes a turn for the worst. We don't have much time to act, but I'm still willing to take charge to save the day. George winked at Carly, and she smiled slightly. Eric rolled his eyes. And what exactly are your credentials, doctor? My sister is suffering from a very rare disease. Have you ever treated someone with the same disease successfully? Eric, please. Carly pleaded. Let the doctor do his job. It's all right, Carla. I'm happy to explain that I recently received my doctorate from the prestigious Royal College of Medicine. 
It's true that your sister's illness is rare. In fact, it's the first and only case in Detroit, and the success rate of the treatment I'm proposing is only 10%. 10%? That's it? Eric scoffed. That's not good enough. She's getting worse by the day, Eric, Carla added. We have to do something. That's right, Carla. And I feel confident that under my care, we'll have at least a 50% chance of saving her because I've done my research and I'm highly invested in a positive outcome. George smiled, exposing his perfectly white teeth. The nurses smiled, happy to be on his team. That sounds encouraging, Carla added. I think we should get started on the treatment quickly. 50%? That's not good enough either. Eric shook his head. He clutched Stephanie's hand. He was glad he came. Without his ancient expertise, this girl was on her way to heaven. If he was allowed to use his ancient healing techniques, he could guarantee her life with 100% accuracy. Besides, he could tell the doctor was only highly motivated in getting into his wife's pants. Doctor, how can you be so arrogant? Eric asked. Excuse me? George scoffed. Carly called me here to help and my wife did the best she could with her knowledge of the disease. As I've said, I've spent several weeks training. Several weeks? George interrupted. I've studied at the highest level for several years. That means nothing to me. I refuse to hand over my sister's life to someone who can only guess at a 50% success rate. I will treat her myself. Everyone gasped. This foolish man cannot be serious. Sir, the patient's breathing has slowed significantly, the nurse said. She's not going to make it much longer if we don't intervene. Stop messing around, Carly said. Dr. Bates is the best in Detroit. He studied at the best university, and he came here to help us at my personal request. Only he can save Stephanie. Step aside and let him do his job. No, I said I will treat her myself. I am more capable than you realize. You seem very confident, Mr. Turner. That must have been some retreat you went to. Was there ayahuasca involved? Because you are acting delusional. I am 100% certain that I can heal my sister. Now please, step aside, you dimwit. Eric, apologize to Dr. Bates at once, Carly demanded. Eric said nothing. She shook his shoulders to knock some sense into him. Are you crazy? Hurry up and apologize before he walks out on us. I'm not crazy. I am the only one that can cure Stephanie from this dreadful disease. The doctor shook his head. Carly and the nurses frowned. Don't look at me like that, Eric snapped. I'll never apologize to someone as arrogant as you, Dr. Know-Nothing. What the hell, Eric? Carly snapped. Why are you insulting him like that? He's here to help. George smiled. It's okay, Carla. His week away searching the internet for voodoo spells has him feeling good about himself. Let's see what he can do. Excellent. I'll need a few tools. Eric sat preparing himself. Eric, please no, Carla whispered. Don't make a fool of yourself. If you keep going on like this, Stephanie will slip away. We've got to act fast. Let George start his treatment already. Tell you what, George added. Let's make a bet. A bet? Eric asked. What are we betting on? We're betting on your sister's life, of course. You said only you can cure her with 100% accuracy. I bet you can't. Carly stepped between the proud man and pleaded with the doctor. I'm sorry for the way my husband is acting, George. I understand if you're upset, but please don't take it out on Stephanie. She doesn't deserve this. Eric stepped in front of Carly and smiled. Are you sure you want to bed with me, doctor? You wouldn't dare. George stared Eric down with cold eyes. Why wouldn't I dare? What do I have to lose? Eric said. That's a good question, doctor. What happens if you lose? George thought. He said with a smile. I'll jump out the window if you can cure her. Eric looked out the window. From the seventh floor... If the doctor didn't die, he would be crippled. Everyone clearly had no faith in him to cure Stephanie. Eric shook his head. I won't make you jump out the window. But if you lose, I just want you to 
roll around on the ground in the lobby and shout at the top of your lungs that you're a dirty, rotten loser. The idea of embarrassing the doctor excited him more than causing him physical pain. Stop it, Eric, Carly huffed. This has gone too far. Fine, I'll accept that bet. And if you lose, George asked coldly, what do I get? I won't lose, Eric said confidently. But if I did, what would you like, doctor? George smiled. He looked at Carly and then back at Eric. He couldn't say what he really wanted, which was Carly's hand in marriage. So he made up something else. If you can't cure your sister, I get to slap you across your stupid face 100 times. One time for each percent you felt so foolishly confident. What do you say? You accept the bet? George extended his hand out to shake on the bet to make it official. Eric took the bait and shook the doctor's hand. They were literally betting on whether Stephanie would live or die. For everything you're hungry for, there's only one place. Mothers. Everyone was speechless. The nurses, Carly, and Dr. Bates looked at each other in dismay. They didn't expect a lowly man like Eric to gamble with his sister's life, even though he often spent days inside the casinos trying to raise money for her treatments. To say he was a gambling man was an understatement. Carly had long since given up hope on her husband, Eric. Still, she felt sad for Stephanie. Her only hope of survival was just taken away by her own stupid brother. What was he thinking? Eric went to Stephanie's bedside and stroked her pale face. She was so close to death, and her condition was worsening by the minute. Eric knew if he came here only one day later, she would be dead. He was flooded with memories of the old Eric playing with her as they grew up. The new Eric could feel the love in his heart for this little sister he'd inherited along with this new body. He was determined to save her. It's time to begin the treatment, Eric said. He turned to the nurses and added, Please get me 27 silver needles. One inch, three inches, and seven inches. I need nine needles of each length. The details are very important. The nurses looked at each other confused. Why was he asking for needles? Dr. Bates' treatment involved IVs to keep her hydrated and a very specific cocktail of chemical medications. Do I need to repeat myself? Eric asked with a sigh. Come on, this is important. Write it down so you don't get it wrong. Go on, get him what he needs, George told the nurses. One of them took out a pad and wrote down Eric's instructions. 27 needles, 1 inch... Three inches and seven inches. Nine needles of each length. The exact lengths are very important. This ought to be good. George whispered to the nurses as they left the room to fetch this crazy man's acupuncture needles. Carly sat in the corner and cried as Eric washed his hands in the sink to prepare himself. He was an old monster who had lived for more than 5,000 years. He had learned nearly a hundred methods to cure the sick during his long life. He knew at least three ways to treat Stephanie's illness. But this was the most accurate one he knew. To properly clear his mind, he practiced ten rounds of even count breathing. Once he was ready, he walked over to Carla crying in the corner. He hugged her, but she pushed him away. She couldn't believe how he turned down George's help that she worked so hard to get. She cared about Stephanie and couldn't stand to think how close she was to death. Please, trust me, my dear. I will save my sister, he whispered. Carly looked away, refusing to meet his gaze. She wanted to punch his lights out for being so careless. Soon, a nurse returned with the needles he requested. They weren't the precise lengths he asked for, but they were close enough so he could make do. Help me turn her over, please, he said to the nurse. George nodded his approval. The nurses helped him flip Stephanie over onto her front. He opened the back of her hospital gown, exposing her spine. He massaged her back as he chanted silently. The chant would be more effective if said out loud, but he didn't want to tip 
everyone off to his exact methods, so he chanted silently. He placed one-inch needles first at various intervals on her spine, at each core chakra. Next, he placed the three-inch needles along each of her arms. He worked fast and efficiently, not pausing to contemplate or adjust. He knew exactly what he was doing. The seven-inch needles were carefully placed in Stephanie's neck, in a circle near the medulla oblongata. The nine-inch needles were then placed in various points in her skull. Carla winced as she watched Eric work. Who was this man? Her good-for-nothing husband acted so out of character, she barely recognized him. Eric closed his eyes and stood over Stephanie's body. It looked like he was praying. Was he really praying for a miracle? Because that's what they needed at this point. He was actually silently chanting at rapid speed. Aum tatsat, aum tatsat, aum tatsat, aum. Everyone watched with bated breath as he prepared to place the final nine-inch needle at the base of her skull. It actually looked like he had some skill. Carly wondered if he was telling the truth. Maybe he did go off and study some ancient healing technique for the last few weeks he'd gone missing. God, I hope so, she thought to herself. George was still calm on the surface, but deep inside, there was a hint of unease. It's impossible that this lunatic could use some weird ancient acupuncture technique to save this woman, right? Then something unexpected happened. The moment Eric placed the final needle inside Stephanie's skull, her heart monitor beeped, showing an increase in her heart rate. Get the defibrillators and stand by, George told the nurses. She's going into cardiac arrest. George turned to Eric and said, Whatever the hell you're doing, you're killing your sister. Her body can't handle it. Carly soft into George's shoulder. He gladly comforted her. She looked up when she heard the nurses gasp. Stephanie's arm moved. She bent her arms and lifted her face. She turned to Eric and said, Is that... is that you, Eric? He smiled and said, It's me, my darling sister. I'm here. You're okay. Could it be? Had his weird little treatment worked? George, Carly, and the nurses couldn't believe it. To save someone on the verge of death in mere minutes, it was a miracle. Eric helped his sister sit up. He carefully removed the needles from her back and asked her, How do you feel? I feel great, Stephanie said with a smile. How long have I been out? Don't worry about that. We're only looking forward to the future now. Stephanie nodded as tears rolled down her face. Eric hugged her tight. Even though he'd only inherited her as a sister a few hours ago, the 5,000-year-old soul that inhabited his body felt deeply connected to her now. Carla raced over and joined their embrace. How did you do it? She asked Eric. He only smiled and enjoyed a family hug. Eric knew that he would have to treat Stephanie a few more times for the illness to be gone completely, but she was safe now under his care. I don't believe it, George said. What kind of witchcraft are you practicing, Mr. Turner? Tell me the truth. Eric looked up from his warm family embrace to see George Bates tiptoeing out of the hospital room. Dr. Bates, where do you think you're going? Well, I... I thought I'd give you some space to be with your family, George said, embarrassed. He couldn't believe the turn of events he just witnessed. It does feel nice to have my family back together. I think I can take a little break to go down to the lobby with you, Eric said with a smirk. What do you mean? the doctor asked, playing dumb. Don't tell me you forgot our little bet. Let's go down to the lobby together. I can't wait to see you rolling around, telling everyone what a dirty, rotten little loser you are. Eric! Carly scolded. George faked a laugh. I was just joking when I made that bet. Don't take it too hard. You were joking when you bet against my sister's life? You have a very sick sense of humor, doctor. Her life is no laughing matter. Both the old and new Eric Turner were petty and loved to hold a grudge. 
George's face turned a dark purple. You did shake on the bat, Carly teased. Shut up, George yelled at Carly, causing her to flinch. What do you know about modern medicine? How dare you bring your husband in here to make a mockery of this hospital and my well-earned degree? This whole situation is a liability, and I can't have any part of it. Excuse me? Carly said, stunned. Don't you dare speak to my wife that way, you idiot! Eric yelled. You're just mad that my ancient healing technique works better than your well-earned degrees, you pompous asshole! Carla smiled slightly, surprised to hear Eric sticking up for himself and for her. Her husband had always been a coward, but today he felt like a changed man. First, he saved his sister with some miracle technique, and now he stood up for them without flinching. I'll give you one last chance to stay true to your word, doctor. Eric repeated the terms of the bet. Go down to the lobby. Roll around like the slob you are. And tell everyone what a loser you are. You can remind them that you went to the Royal College of Medicine if you want. You've taken this too far, George said. Another nurse raced into the room and said, Dr. Bates, you're needed in the ER. A young girl with a rattlesnake bite needs assistance. Can you help? The doctor breathed a sigh of relief for the excuse to leave without having to stay true to the wager he confidently made. I'm sorry, but I must be going now. People need me. He waved goodbye and left with the nurses in tow. Son of a... Eric mumbled. Forget about him, dear. Carly turned her attention back to Stephanie. How are you feeling? Are you ready to leave this dreadful place? Yes, please. I feel totally fine now. When do you think I can go home? I'll talk to someone about getting you discharged immediately, Carly promised. Why don't you take a shower while we get you checked out? Eric suggested. Stephanie nodded, excited to get back to her life outside the dingy hospital walls. Eric and Carly left the room to give Stephanie some space. I can't believe Stephanie went from death's door to discharge in the matter of minutes. Tell me honestly, how did you do it? Carly asked. Oh, it was nothing. Thanks for looking after her while I was away. Carly's face turned cold. I didn't know if you were coming back at all. You could have been dead in a ditch for all I knew. I should have told you where I was going, but I didn't want you to talk me out of it. I'm sorry. Carly nodded. I wish you would have told me, but you're right. I would have told you studying some ancient healing techniques sounded like a foolish idea. But with you gone, I felt like Stephanie's survival was solely on my shoulders. So I paid Dr. Bates a lot of money to come here. I'll pay you back for all the medical expenses you paid. I promise. Maybe you should find a reliable job first, Carly said sarcastically. I will. Eric knew she meant what she said, and he already had a plan to transfer his wealth from his previous life to his new name. In his previous life, he was very rich and had even been in Forbes magazine. Knowing his days in that old body were numbered, he transferred half of his assets to many of his loyal disciples when he made a will. If he could get... 1% of that half, he'd be the wealthiest man in Detroit. My family thinks you've abandoned me. They already didn't like you, and now... Eric searched his memory bank for the members of Carly's family. Yup, they thought he was worthless. So he'd have a lot to prove now. Especially to his mother-in-law, Poppy Anderson. She was a high-powered persecuting attorney and liked to grill him. The new Eric was determined to win her over now. Let me take care of your family. Carly looked surprised. Really? That'd be great. I haven't been to the office in days, so it'd be nice to catch up on some work. Sounds good. Take care of your work affairs, and I'll go take care of your mother. Carly smiled. She liked this new side to Eric. While the hospital prepared to discharge Stephanie, Eric and Carla went their separate ways. He took a cab to her family's sprawling estate. Manicure lawns, a white picket fence, 
columns more grand than the White House, the Anderson family did well for themselves. Inside the well-appointed living room, a middle-aged woman leisurely sipped a cup of tea on the pleated sofa. Two servants waited on her hand and foot, feeding her grapes and massaging her feet. This was the one and only Poppy Anderson. The pleasure of the moment faded for her when she saw Eric Turner enter. He greeted her with open arms. Mom, how are you? It's been too long. Poppy raised her teacup and leisurely sipped her tea, completely ignoring Eric. He understood why he was getting the cold shoulder, but the new Eric had little patience for arrogance, so he turned to leave. So you still consider me your mother? She asked. He turned back around to re-engage. Although Lynn Poppy's tone was calm, her two servants shivered and looked at Eric with sympathy. After serving Poppy for so many years, they knew the calmer she was on the surface, the angrier she was. Mom, there was a very important reason for my recent absence. Eric started to explain. What's the matter with you, you lazy good-for-nothing jerk? With all due respect, he said, but she cut him off. Get a job, you freeloader. And no, gambling while drunk doesn't count. What could he say? His former self was indeed like that. How could he convince her that he was a changed man? I'll pay you back all the money I owe you right away. Poppy laughed. You'll pay us back? Has hell frozen over? You'll see, my dearest mother-in-law. I will pay you back soon. Poppy continued to ridicule Eric. Soon, huh? Yeah, right. Tomorrow never comes with people like you. Save your promises for the slot machines down at the casino. I understand why you say that, but I am a changed man, Eric promised. Poppy laughed so hard she almost cried. Eric understood that actions speak louder than words and began strategizing in his head about how he'd get the money from his previous life transferred into his new name. Mr. Green, the Anderson's family butler, entered the room. Excuse me, madam. Major Hamlin's secretary is here to visit. Major Hamlin's secretary? What is he doing here? Poppy stood up, surprised. She shooed her servants away, and they happily left the room. I don't know why he's here, but it seems to be very urgent. He looks extremely worried, explained Mr. Green. Great, more fires to put out as always. Let him in, Poppy told Mr. Green. She didn't whisper to Eric. Don't say a word, you idiot. If you embarrass me in front of this man, I'll castrate you. Eric nodded. He had to admit, his mother-in-law was quite the character. He could see why she was such a successful attorney. A young black man in a sharp suit and tie entered the living room with a deep furrow in his brow. Poppy plastered on a fake smile to greet him. Mr. Quinton Brown, what an honor to have you in my home. Would you like some tea? That won't be necessary, Quinton said without sitting. I need a favor and fast. I can't stress enough that time is of the essence. Anything for the mayor's office? Poppy said with a sickly sweet smile. What can I do for you, Quinton? I need you to find someone for me. Of course. Who are you looking for? Poppy asked. Your son-in-law. The word on the street is that his medical skills are outstanding, miraculous even. My son-in-law? You must be mistaken. Word travels fast, and I heard he miraculously saved a woman from near death at the hospital just this afternoon. Don't hold back on me, Poppy. This is a matter of life or death. I understand. There must be some mistake. Poppy looked at Eric and then back at Quinton. My son-in-law is... Well, look at him. She rolled her eyes, embarrassed to be seen with Eric in the presence of the mayor's secretary. You're Miss Anderson's son-in-law? Yes, nice to meet you. Eric said as he shook Mr. Brown's hand. I am indeed the person you're looking for. He's joking, Poppy said annoyed. This is my son-in-law, Eric. 
Trust me, he's good for nothing. Quinton looked confused. Did you heal someone today at the hospital? Yes, I did. Poppy almost choked on her tea. Stop talking nonsense, Eric, she pleaded with Quinton. Ignore him. He doesn't know anything about medicine. His own sister is lying in the hospital on her deathbed. We spent so much money trying to save her, but alas. Your sister? Yes, you're the person I'm looking for. Quentin's eyes lit up. You saved your sister's life today. As soon as we heard about it, I went out searching for you. Well, you found me, Eric said. What can I do for you? I'm so glad I found you. I'm here to tell you about Mayor Hamlin's daughter. She's an amazing little girl that needs immediate medical attention. Will you see her? I can explain on the way. Sure, I'd be happy to help. Quinton shook Eric's hand. Great, let's go. Poppy's jaw dropped as she watched Eric leave with the mayor's secretary. She'd been trying to win his favor for years, and her good-for-nothing son-in-law waltzed in like he knew about medicine. This can't be possible, she mumbled. What if Eric pretended he knew medicine and then made that little girl's condition worse? This could be disastrous. Back at the hospital, in the emergency room, Dr. George Bates watched over a six-year-old little girl lying in bed. Her face was blue, and she trembled with pain. George whispered to the nurse, The poison has already spread to her heart. It can't be stopped. The little girl had been bitten by a rattlesnake less than an hour ago, but the underfounded hospital didn't have the antidote so the poison continued to spread throughout the little girl's body. There was nothing George could do. Inform the patient's parents and help them prepare for the worst, George sighed. Maybe what Eric Turner said was right. Maybe he was a half-baked doctor. Let's wait a little longer. The nurse was hopeful that the word of what Eric did earlier would spread. She hoped Mr. Brown would be able to bring Eric back to save the little girl. George shook his head. The venom has already spread to the heart. What are you waiting for? Our work is done here. I'm waiting for... Eric Turner, the nurse said. Waiting for that snake oil salesman? Huh. Do you really think of him as a god or something? George couldn't believe it. The nurse pushed. You have to admit that he has some sort of ability. Yes, but when the venom spreads to the heart, even if God himself were to come, it would be useless. George snorted and left in a huff. Not only did he refuse to be showed up by that weirdo twice in one day, he also didn't believe it was possible to save the little girl. In the emergency waiting room, a middle-aged man and woman paced back and forth anxiously. When they saw Dr. Bates come out, they hurriedly went to greet him. Doctor, how is our baby girl doing? Please, tell us the good news. I'm sorry. We've done our best. George said matter-of-factly. He didn't realize the father was Mayor Lee Hamlin, a prominent Detroit politician, second in command. If he had known, he would have handled the situation much more delicately. Upon hearing the awful news, Mrs. Hamlin fell limply to the ground, weeping silently. Was her baby girl really dying of a snake bite? Just then, Quentin Brown appeared with Eric in tow. George's face fell when he saw Eric again. He couldn't shake this guy. Eric walked past George without a word or gesture. All he cared about was the little girl. Quentin introduced Eric to Lee Hamlin. Sir, I found the man we heard about. He's willing to treat her. Sounds like you're too late, Lee said with a sigh. The doctor just told us there's nothing we can do. That's right, George confirmed. The venom has spread to her heart. When that happens, there's nothing else we can do to stop it. I'm sorry for your loss. Eric looked at the mother sobbing on the floor. He couldn't let this self-par hospital let that little girl die. Let me go in and take a look, 
Maybe there's something I can do to help, Eric said. Lee nodded. Eric stormed past George and marched into the emergency room. He vowed to do anything in his power to save that little girl. Mr. Turner, you're finally here. The nurse's face lit up with hope. She prayed he'd be able to save this little girl. Eric put his finger on the girl's wrist to check her pulse. It's not too late. There's still time. Really? The nurse smiled. Bring me the silver needles, Eric said. The nurse sprung into action. She already had the needles prepared in case he showed up, so she grabbed them and handed them over. Eric took a deep breath. He used a different technique than what he used on his sister. He called it the Six Direction Needle. He lifted the girl's hospital gown to expose her belly and carefully placed six needles in a circle around her belly button. The nurse watched him work his magic. Eric silently chanted as he worked the technique quickly. He left the needles in for five minutes. During that time, the girl gagged and wheezed. As he slowly took out each needle, venom poured out of each puncture spot. The perfectly placed needles pulled the venom from the body and pulled it into one spot. Now it was pouring out of the lucky little girl. She stopped trembling, and the color returned to her face and lips. She was miraculously healed. Thanks, doctor. I feel so much better now. The little girl said with a sweet smile that melted Eric's heart. I'll go tell the parents that she'll be just fine. He said to the nurse as he washed his hands. Eric walked out of the emergency room and found Quentin comforting Mr. and Mrs. Hamlin. They perked up when they saw Eric approach them. Your daughter is awake and well. Go in and take a look. The mother cried tears of joy and relief. Lee Hamlin gave Eric a big hug. You're not joking, are you? I would never joke about something like that. Go back and see your daughter. Hold her tight each and every day, okay? I will. Lee Hamlin and his wife Susan rushed into the emergency room with Quinton and Toe. They raced to their daughter's bedside and were amazed to see her sitting up and laughing with the nurse. They couldn't believe it. Eric really did save her life. It was a miracle. They hugged their little girl tight and rejoiced in the moment. Where's Dr. Bates? Lee Hamlin asked the nurse. How dare he condemn my little girl to death like that? He scared us unnecessarily. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding, sir. Typically, the doctor would have been right. If it weren't for Mr. Turner, she would be dead. The mayor nodded. Quinton, go get Eric Turner so I can properly thank him. Quinton smiled and ran to the waiting room to grab Eric, but he was nowhere to be found. He didn't stay for the gratitude or even payment. Anyone else would want the glory of performing such a miracle. Quinton ran back to Mayor Hamlin and said, Sir, Eric Turner is gone. Gone? Lee Hamlin said, stunned. Why did he leave? He doesn't like praise or what? I've never met a man like that in my life. Quinton couldn't believe it either. Everyone wanted to carry favor with the mayor, but didn't know how. And this man had the perfect opportunity to ask for anything he wanted, but he didn't take it. What an amazing man to have on your side. I'd like to get to know him better. Lee laughed heartily. Definitely, Quentin agreed. What about Dr. Bates? Susan asked her husband. He was ready to let our daughter die. We can't let him get away with such negligence. The mayor agreed. Quinton, call Chief Smith from the Health Bureau. Tell him that I want Dr. George Bates out of the Detroit City Medical System. He'll never practice medicine in this town again. Quinton nodded. I'm on it. Eric took a cab home to the Anderson family estate where he lived. Today's two healing sessions had consumed a lot of his physical strength. And even with his tough personality, he still couldn't bear it. 
so after a quick shower, he fell deep asleep. Memories of his past life swirled into moments from Eric Turner's life. His soul merged even deeper with this new body. Early the next morning, he was awakened by a kick. What time did you come back last night? Carly's face was cold as she looked at Eric, who was still in a daze. It's so early in the morning. What's the matter, dear? Eric ruffled his messy hair. What the hell was Carly so upset about? Who told you you could sleep in my bed? You're my wife. If I don't get in your bed, should I go to some other woman's bed? He searched his memory bank and realized his former self never slept with his wife. But when he got back, he was so tired, he forgot about this matter. In the future, you're not allowed to enter my room without my permission. Now, please, get out. Although Eric's performance at the hospital yesterday had indeed exceeded Carly's expectations, their relationship still needed a lot of work. She wasn't ready to share her bed with him. Okay, okay, okay. I'll go out. Eric got out of bed, put on his slippers, and stumbled down the hall to his own bedroom. He hadn't even been lying down for an hour when Carly came in again to wake him up. Get up. I'm hungry. Go buy some groceries and make me some breakfast. Carly demanded. Eric sighed and got out of bed. Anything for you, my dear. He'd have to work on this unique marriage of his. But for now, he'd do as he was told so he didn't ruffle too many feathers. His transition to this body was complete, but he didn't want anyone suspecting anything about his new personality. After washing up, Eric rode his electric bike to the farmer's market. He often did the grocery shopping, so everyone at the market knew him and greeted him enthusiastically. He replied with a smile as he recalled each vendor from his memory bank. His old soul had lived for 5,000 years, but it was his first time buying groceries. He somehow always had other people do it for him. The experience was humbling for him. After he had everything he needed to make breakfast, Eric got on his electric bike and drove back to the Andersons' family estate. Although it was still early in the morning, the house was bustling with noise and excitement. A brand new bright red Lamborghini was parked outside with 999 roses inside. It was truly a sight to be seen. Clearly, someone was there to make a grand romantic gesture, possibly even to propose marriage. Who was this lavish show of affection for? In fact, it was a proposal. The man in the white suit kneeling on one knee was Byron Colton, the owner of Golden Real Estate. Standing in front of Byron was Eric's wife, Carly Anderson. Byron held out an enormous diamond ring with both his hands and said with a passionate expression, Carly, marry me. He's not worthy of you. You know it. Only I can make you happy. Carly took a step back and looked at Byron coldly. Byron, I'll say it again. No matter how hopeless Eric is, I will never divorce him. Give up on this pursuit as soon as possible. Carly, why? You have a long life ahead of you and you don't have to waste it on Eric. Ask yourself, did he ever give you joy when you were with him? Byron sighed. He really did like Carly. Otherwise, with his position as a chairman, why would he pursue a married woman? Byron's words reached Carly's heart. Indeed, during the one year she had been with Eric, she had rarely smiled, and the entire Anderson family had received a lot of criticism because of him. Seeing that Carly was moved, Byron continued to implore her. Carly, if you weren't thinking of yourself, you should at least be thinking of your aunt and uncle. They deserve to have peace since they have raised you. But because Eric is not good enough, they are humiliated wherever they go. Can you bear to watch them go through this? 
no matter how one looked at it. Byron was the best choice. He had a fortune of over a hundred million. He was considerate. And more importantly, he really liked Carly. He didn't mind that Carly was married. Compared to Byron, Eric was like a fly on the wall, totally insignificant. Carly felt the urge to agree for her family's sake. Carly, it's just a farce between you and Eric. You and I are the perfect match. Byron then pointed to the big red Ferrari behind him. Carly, do you see that Ferrari behind us? I brought that here for you. As long as you agree to marry me, I'll have my father arrange three villas in the Imperial View Estate as gifts for your uncle and aunt. Three villas in the Imperial View Estate? Hearing this, Poppy Anderson's eyes widened. Detroit's Imperial View Estate was the best high-end residential estate. Any random villa there would have a value of more than 10 million. Byron was really trying. Poppy's heart was not the only one moved. Many people of the residential area who came to watch the show were filled with envy. They had never witnessed such a scene. In order to marry a woman, this man used a Ferrari as a deposit and gave away three villas as gifts. At this moment, Eric slowly approached on his electric bike. From far away, Eric could see the crowd surrounding his house. When he got close enough to hear the words, Eric's face turned dark. Is Carla in her right mind? Compared to an impressive person like Byron, Eric is just a nobody. No, Eric is even less than a nobody. Yeah, one Ferrari and three villas. If I were Carla, I would marry Byron today. Two heavily made-up women discussed in an unrestrained manner, completely unaware that their gossip was actually directed at the person standing behind them. Eric was very angry. In just the little time that he went away to run an errand, there were suitors coming to his house. They wanted to disgrace him and steal his wife. But did they really think that Eric was a softie, that they could treat him however they wanted to? Maybe the old version of Eric was, but not anymore. Watch out, let me through, Eric said impatiently. The crowd cleared the path. Eric mounted his electric bike. He fiercely twisted the accelerator and it shot toward Byron like an arrow leaving the bow. Byron, who was still half kneeling in front of Carly, had no idea that Eric had already arrived behind him. Carly. Byron wanted to say more, but he felt something was wrong. Eric rode his electric bike over the roses, directly charging toward Byron without hesitation. Byron turned around. When he saw Eric's electric bike charging at him like a crazy horse, Byron was scared out of his wits and quickly took a step to the left. Eric sneered. Holding the bike's handle, he fiercely squeezed the brake and made a cool tail flick in front of everyone. Byron was hit by the tail of Eric's electric bike and was flung away like a rubber ball. He was confused by the collision and felt like his body was about to fall apart. Eric, you stupid! Byron tried to curse, but Eric was already in front of him. The next second, Byron felt his neck tighten and was grabbed by the collar by Eric, who lifted him up like a feather. Jerk, you have some nerve trying to take advantage of my wife. He really didn't expect Byron to be this arrogant. Before he and Carla even divorced, he dared come to his house and propose to her. He was so disrespectful. Looking at Eric's extremely stern eyes, Byron couldn't help but shiver. How could this good-for-nothing have such a terrifying gaze? Byron's sound couldn't help but soften. Eric, I really like Carla. I want to compete fairly with you. Damn you. Eric couldn't help but curse. Was this guy crazy? Carly has only been married for a year, and now he was talking about some kind of competition? If you have something to say, then say it. Don't curse. Curse? Eric sneered. Not only will I curse at you today, 
I will also beat the crap out of you. Eric kicked Byron to the ground. He hit me. He's beating me up. Someone, come quickly. Byron panicked. He had not brought any bodyguards with him today. And he was all about talking. His fighting skills were not even comparable to a kid's. He didn't even dare to think about fighting with Eric. Go ahead. Scream all you want. No one will come to save you. Eric chuckled, rolled up his sleeves, and punched Byron. Byron howled miserably as he hid behind Poppy. But he saved me. Poppy was shocked. Just a moment ago, she thought Byron to be a candidate for a son-in-law. But in the blink of an eye, Byron's behavior was disappointing her greatly. Eric, what do you think you're doing? If you hurt Byron, you're dead for sure. You're so impulsive. I don't care if you die, but don't implicate us. Poppy protected Byron. Thanks for listening.